the 10 worst legendary cards ever. Hey, buddy, watch this. That's right. I think I'm going to answer the question here that no one's really asked. What's the worst legendary in the history of Hearthstone? It's a really tough question, but thankfully this video was sponsored by Keeps, which we'll talk about a little more later. So I had some time to sit down and ponder this one and come up with my list for the worst ones of all time. Starting off here at the number 10 spot, I have Dr. Morrigan. And I think this really sets the tone for the video because you know if she's number 10, there are nine cards worse than her. That says a lot about the quality of cards in this video. But Dr. Morrigan, even after being buffed, gaining a two mana discount, remember, this used to cost eight mana. I thought it was seven, I had to look it up. She was eight mana. That was unbelievably bad because even at six mana, she's still not good. This is not a card that's being played. Yes, yeah, some people have tested her in like some plot twist Nazoth stuff, but those are not powerful deck lists at any point right now. There are some decent Nazoth lists, but they don't run Dr. Morrigan because it turns out this death rattle is just way too risky. You could accidentally pull a Nazoth out of your deck. So pulling key cards with strong battle cries or cards that require specific timing is bad. Also, you can pull really small weak minions out of your deck too, which you don't want to do. You want to get something big here, and there's just never been a deck that supports that well. When you compare Dr. Morgan to other things Warlock has used successfully, like Possessed Lackey, for instance, that was a card that pulled a specific thing, a demon, so it was controllable, you could build your deck around it. That worked. Dr. Morgan doesn't work. Whether at 8 mana or at 6, this is still a bad card, and because she spent so long at the completely, unbelievably unplayable 8 mana spot, she earned her spot right here. Up next here we have the Boogie Monster, a card you may have totally forgotten about. I wouldn't blame you, it's a pretty easy one to forget. It's a 6-7 for 8 mana. And you might say, well, Regis, it has an upside, it has card text. Well, not really, because if you play a Boogie Monster, there are very, very few instances where this thing actually gets to attack and kill something, and even when it does, it only gets a plus two, plus two buff, which just isn't significant enough, because it's taken so much damage via a trade, in most cases that the health is too low, your opponent gets to easily deal with it. So you have here a legendary card with a really boring effect that has almost no upside. It's really impossible to get this thing to snowball into really big stats. Compared to a card like Gruul, which just automatically gets bigger, the boogie monster looks just ridiculously bad, and remember, Gruul's not a good card either. Gruul is not great, and the Boogie Monster is like 10 times worse. More expensive, less reliable, and less upside, and slower buffs mean the Boogie Monster is just really, really, really bad. Next up here, we have Sergeant Sally, another card that would be very, very easy to forget. It's basically a self-contained Shadow Flame. When Sergeant Sally dies, she deals damage to the board, so theoretically, if you can buff Sergeant Sally's attack, it could be a sort of efficient way to remove your opponent's stuff. But there's a couple problems there. Usually with Death Rattle minions, your opponent gets to decide when they're dying on their turn. So you play Sergeant Sally down, even if she does magically have four or five attack, making her a three mana board clear, your opponent could just ignore it for a turn and go face and then do whatever they want to do or kind of build their board around the Sergeant Sally. So then you're kind of delayed another turn and killing her. If you kill your Sergeant Sally yourself, you're looking at a two mana inefficient board clear that probably required tons of setup because you have to somehow buff the attack. So yes, theoretically in a hand buff deck, maybe Sergeant Sally could have made sense, but hand buff decks didn't work. That's super inconsistent. It goes counter to what hand buff decks generally want to do anyway. So all in all, Sergeant Sally just didn't line up on her own. She didn't line up with the deck she's intended to support, meaning she completely fell into total obscurity and became an unplayable card that to this day, I don't think anyone's really put in a competitive deck. Next up here, we have Harbinger Celestia. Unfortunately, a couple Boomsday Project cards on this list already. This one is a mirror entity of sorts, but it's a four mana mirror entity that anybody can play. So theoretically, if this worked well, you might be able to say like, turn this into a Ragnaros and your opponent plays a Ragnaros. The unfortunate reality for Celestia is that most decks are running really cheap, low cost, bad minions, which means you spend four mana to get like a one, one or maybe a two, two if you're super, super lucky. And it's a known effect, unlike mirror entity, which is a secret. So your opponent knows to play around it and they can avoid it unless they're just totally blanking out and don't know what this card is or fail to read the card text, 
which did happen to us famously one time and it was amazing, but that's not <laughs> the standard use case for this one. So you give your opponent all the knowledge to play around it. The upside's really not even that high if it does roll perfectly and your opponent has to play a Ragnaros. You're maybe just getting kind of four mana in value uh, as opposed to running something proactive in four mana that's consistent and awesome. So a card with a built-in downside like this, I mean, yes, theoretically, if your opponent uh, doesn't play a minion, you get a 5-6 with stealth for four mana, which is really good. But in nearly every case, they're going to activate this. It's going to punish you, and it's going to feel really, really bad. For this card to be good, it probably needed to be like three mana or have way more stats, some kind of additional upside. Because as it stands right now, there's absolutely zero reason to put this thing in a real deck. Moving on here to <laughs> Himmet Nessingwary. Another card you may have forgotten about, it was pretty readily mocked even in its era in Goblins vs. Gnomes. We all kind of knew just how bad this card was back then, and that definitely hasn't changed. Even though, yes, theoretically, single target removal attached to a body seems kind of good, right? Like, oh man, I get to kill something and play something? That's amazing. When you look at alternatives like Big Game Hunter, for instance, him at Nessing Wary starts to look really bad really fast because Big Game Hunter can work against anything. Him at Nessing Wary very narrow in its approach in that it only affects beasts. So basically in half the games that you'd encounter with him at Nessing Wary in your deck, maybe your opponent doesn't run any beast. Even in a world where there are a lot of beasts in Hearthstone right now, most of them are low cost. They're like two or three mana cards and Nessing Wary is just not all that good. You'd rather just play a good five drop that does something than react to your opponent's like 1-1 one, one, or 2-2 two, two beast. So we've got a card here that's super situational, really bad base stat line, and the swing, although sometimes great in most cases, really doesn't do much at all, leaving him as a very awkward tech card. When you compare this to an even better comparison, something like Hungry Crab, for instance, that's one mana, it destroys a Murloc, it gains stats, whereas him at Nessing Warrior just doesn't do anything. It's like 10 times worse than all of the comparables that you can make leaving this as a very, very, very weak card. So next up here is my good friend Murabi, and man, I tried everything to make this card feel good, but it turns out Free Shaman never, ever gets there. Maybe someday, 10 years into the future, there will be enough cards for it to make sense, but there are some fundamental flaws with Murabi that really hold him back, right? Number one is availability of freeze mechanics in Shaman. Most of them are pretty weak cards to support this, so you're kind of hampering your deck right off the bat because you got to run bad cards to support a bad card. Beyond that, Murabi is all about value generation and very, very low on tempo, which is not generally great in Hearthstone unless it's infinite value that persists over the course of the game. Murabi is a one-time thing. Maybe you get a couple minions back, best case scenario, but that's just a couple card generations. It's not a big deal, and you sacrifice usually a ton of tempo in the process because this is a very low stat, fairly high cost minion. So big downside to playing this, not a lot of upside, even when it works perfectly. And of course, getting it to work is really, really hard and your deck is bad. So ultimately, Murabi is just a failed archetype, uh, the centerpiece of that failed archetype. And he's not nearly strong enough on his own to support that. The payoff just isn't there. So I'm super sad about it, but Murabi is super bad. So as we move into the top four here, or sort of the bottom four, I guess, depending on your perspective, we're taking a little bit of a shift. Every previous card was just bad. It, it generally did something good for you, but it wasn't good enough. The remaining cards are all cards that can straight up lose you the game. So these are kind of in a separate tier of bad. They're not just like weak plays that are positively aligned. These are weak plays that can backfire tremendously and give your opponent chances to win. For instance, with Major Domo Executus, if you play this card and you actually do turn into Ragnaros the Fire Lord, which man, I haven't seen that in a long time, but you go down to eight health, which means your opponent can kill you super easily. It's one of the riskiest things you can do because eight health just isn't much. Most decks have ways to push some pressure, even if it's just sticking a couple minions, some fireballs in hand, whatever it is, eight health is super minuscule and will often throw the game. So back in the day, even if you weren't running Major Domo Executive, just this existing in a card pool could be a big problem. If it randomly gets summoned, you give your opponent outs to victory that would otherwise be impossible. So that risk of an enormous downside, the risk of throwing an unlosable game because of this card makes Major Domo Executive not only impossible to run in a deck, but really risky just to exist. 
Now, obviously, there's been some people who have used this to their advantage, turned into Ragnaros, pulled off some ridiculous combos, that sort of stuff. But those are memes. Those are shenanigans. They're not real competitive Hearthstone. In that world, in that environment, Executus is tremendously and troublingly terrible. To continue that alliteration, we've got Temporis, another card that will absolutely throw games away. You just can't give your opponent two turns in Hearthstone. That means they can just dump a ton of stats onto the board, have that attacker's initiative as they enter their second turn, and usually just kill you with outright damage, or otherwise just setting up so much value, drawing towards their combo. In every case, Temporis just backfires. Your opponent gets to do too much, and they know that your double turn is coming, so that even if they can't like kill you outright, they can set up defensive walls, they can gain health, they can make plays to also mitigate the risk of your dual turn. So you're just passing every decision point to them they get to take advantage of that and then you're left with the remaining decisions that may not give you any actual action points at all you might just be stuck with nothing to do no way to win the game or just straight up dead meaning temperis even riskier in some ways than major domo executus and that's why i think temperis is number three on this list instead of number four moving on to the number two spot it's the exact same story giving your opponent an upside before you get to utilize that upside and unlike temperis with Duskfall and Aviana, you may not even ever actually realize that upside. Temporis, it's going to happen. If your opponent can't kill you, you get your two turns back guaranteed. With Aviana, your opponent might just kill Aviana, and then you never get your zero mana card. So it's a weaker effect than Temporis. It offers you less kind of game-winning upside with, I'd say, similar amounts of risk. Maybe not quite as risky as Temporis, but... The calculation to me balances out or Aviana is still worse because it's so much harder to actually benefit from her. And it's not much of a roadblock for your opponent either. They kind of just clean out Aviana. They got a huge tempo advantage and you're left with nothing to do. So another card that is terrible when summoned off of random effects. Thankfully, Tempris does not fall into that category as a battle cry card. Aviana does. So just the mere fact she's in the game is a problem. Even if you don't run her in a deck, this card can still hurt you in a lot of ways, which makes Duskfall and Aviana, in my mind, the second worst card in Hearthstone. Now, before I reveal the worst card ever, I want to note that uh, this card has a special secondary honor. Not only does it take the crown here for <laughs> the most unplayable card in history, but it also has, perhaps, the best head of hair of any Hearthstone card. So you might be thinking, hey, is it Darius Crowley? No, Darius is pretty good. Is it Bwan Samdi? That's some nice hair, but no, Bwan Samdi gets played in Combo Priest. Obviously not the worst card. What about Zul Jin? That is an absolutely majestic main. No, it's not Zul Jin. Before I tell you, I want to talk about our sponsor for this video. It's Keeps. And they can definitely help when it comes to having a majestic head of hair like that one. If you don't know Keeps, they offer proven treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss. It turns out two out of three guys will low roll when it comes to RNG and experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. But thankfully, Keeps makes it easy. They've revolutionized the way men are treated for hair loss. You can visit a doctor online and get medication delivered to your home, which means more time for Hearthstone. Keeps treatments are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. So if you're on the way to 35 like me, sounds like a pretty good idea. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash Regis to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Regis. That said, Keeps and I would like to present the worst card ever in Hearthstone with perhaps the best hair. It is obviously Millhouse Mana Storm. Yes, these other cards can lose you the game, but Millhouse Mana Storm can lose you the game on turn two by giving your opponent um, pseudo infinite mana super early in the game. They could just play tons of cards, draw tons more cards, kill you with tons of fireballs and pyroblasts and who knows what else. Millhouse is far and away the riskiest card to play in the entire game. There's no question about that. Because he comes down so early, you lose games at record speed. There is a reason this card is like the ultimate meme of Hearthstone. It's one I joke about all the time. I crafted him in golden for a video, for a joke. 
It just doesn't get any worse than this. This card did technically, kind of, maybe, sort of, a little bit, get played in a real deck, which was the old Call to Arms Paladin, where you could summon the 4-4 body off of Call to Arms, thereby not activating the Battle Cry of Millhouse Mana Storm. But that was like a super fringe version of the deck, and I think win rates actually still suffered because of Millhouse. Because it turns out just a you know couple stats in upside, maybe getting an additional 2-1 in stats over a normal 2-drop is not worth the downside of drawing this card and trying to find some instance to play him or otherwise having a dead card in your hand. So even when you try to really manipulate this perfect scenario to utilize Millhouse's stats instead of his effect, he still hurts your deck. So even in the best of worlds, this is still the worst of cards. And there you go, that wraps it up for this list, guys. The 10 worst legendaries in Hearthstone. Now, this is clearly something that can be hotly debated. I think everybody will recognize the cards on this list are bad. They have not been powerful cards. Now, you might, though, think that something else deserves to be here. I sure want to hear that take. What do you think deserves to be on this list? What would you change about my order? What should be 10th? What should be first? Is Morrigan really deserving of a spot on this list? Share all those thoughts in the comments below. I want to learn from you guys as well. That said, thanks much for watching, and until next time, game on.